question, what is baptism in the Holy Spirit, is an interesting and much debated question. It's actually been debated for a long time. So in some of the Wesleyan tradition, it's uh, sanctification. In the Keswick tradition, uh, which was a Reformed tradition, but saw it as something subsequent to conversion, they thought of it in terms of empowerment for mission. The Reformed tradition largely has identified it with what happens at conversion, although not always. You had the Puritan sealers who thought it was the assurance of salvation that could happen after conversion. So it's, it's interpreted in a lot of different ways. So most Reformed and Baptist circles see it as conversion, and most Arminian circles, holiness circles, Pentecostal circles, see it as something subsequent to salvation. Now, sometimes I'll take one side or the other. In this occasion, some of you will think I'm wishy-washy because I will take both sides. But I'm taking both sides because I think both sides are taught in Scripture, just different texts. But before I go into the texts, let me start with this reminder, uh, although maybe I should have saved it for the end because uh, then people say, ah, yeah, that's true. We don't have to listen to the rest of it. But please listen to the rest anyway. And that is that most of us agree that we receive the Spirit in some way and access to the fullness of the Spirit at conversion. Most of us also agree that we can have subsequent experiences with the Spirit and subsequent developments in our, our spiritual life after conversion. So it's not really so important what we call it, <laughs> the semantics, the nomenclature, as the fact that on the basics, most of us actually agree. But let me go into the context. John the Baptist is the one who's introducing this message. He's preaching that the one coming after me is not going to baptize you just in water like I do. He's going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit and in fire. And, and really, uh, baptism in that context, it had to do with being immersed, immersed in the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, some people have said, okay, baptism in the Spirit is good, baptism in fire must be good too. And have talked about it as, you know, there was something, it used to be called the Fire Baptized Holiness Church, and they were like, I've been baptized in the Holy Ghost and in fire, which was, which was fine the way they meant it, you know, uh, sanctification, but then they, uh, the original leader of it went on to say, and we need more, baptized in oxidite and lidite and so on. And then they, they, they realized he'd lost his mind and threw him out. But many people speak of being fire baptized in a good way. And the way they mean it is a good thing. But is that what John the Baptist meant by it? So in the context in Matthew, it's also there in Luke, but it's a little bit more spread out. The verse immediately before fire baptism is every tree that does not bear the fruit of repentance will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Is it a happy fire or a sad fire? And the verse immediately following it, his winning fork is in his hand, he'll thoroughly clear his threshing floor. So what they would do, they would throw up the, the grain into the air, the wind, or the ruach, the, uh, the spirit, <laughs> would, would blow out the lighter chaff and the wheat would, would fall back to the ground, and then they would burn the chaff. Chaff burned up quickly. It wasn't even very good as fuel. But he says, this chaff will burn with unquenchable fire. Is it a happy fire or a sad fire? Well, some of John's hearers would repent and bear the fruit of repentance. They would be like the trees that were not cut down. Some of them would be like the wheat gathered into the barn but some would be like the chaff burned in the fire and like the trees cast down. When he says, you will be baptized, you will be immersed in the Holy Spirit and fire, the you is plural. Some of them were gonna get the Holy Spirit, some of them were gonna get the fire. And it's true also that the, you know, we can be purified by, by fire and, and so on. Um, it's, it's based on an Old Testament image with God pouring out his spirit in, in a way that, pouring out like in a way that immerses us, that you know, covers us. But that's repeated over and over again. Isaiah 44, you've got it, uh, 44.3, you've got it, Isaiah 59, I believe you have it in, 
in Joel chapter 2 in the English version, it's Joel 3 in the Hebrew and Greek versions. You've got it in Zechariah, you've got it in Ezekiel 37, Ezekiel 39, the idea is kind of in Ezekiel 36. You have this a lot in the Old Testament, that God is going to pour out his spirit on his people. Well, John the Baptist is, is introducing just that, that God is going to pour out his spirit on his people, but judgment on the wicked, which is also in the context of those other passages. And Jesus is God pouring out the spirit on his people. But John, when he's preaching this, is not thinking in terms of, okay, well, uh, you're going to get this aspect of it, you're going to get that aspect. He's not dividing it. This is the eschatological outpouring of the Spirit, which includes all of the Spirit's work. But some passages in the New Testament emphasize more one aspect than another. So in John chapter 3 and verse 5, where Jesus talks about being born of water and of the Spirit, well, there was a Jewish saying, probably this early, in terms of when a Gentile converts to Judaism, this Gentile has become like a newborn child, they're, they're a new person. And whenever a Gentile converted to Judaism, if they were male, they'd be circumcised. But male or female, they'd be immersed in water to wash away their former Gentile and especially idolatrous associations, impurities. And so John the Baptist is doing that with, with water for everybody, um, treating Jewish people just like he would treat Gentiles, you know? Don't think to say, to, we have Abraham as our ancestor, but everybody has to come to God with repentance. But then what you have in John 3, 5, Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, you have to be born from above, and this is not talking about going into your mother's womb again. No, this is talking about being born of the water of the Spirit. So it's like a spiritual proselyte baptism. You're, you're coming into faith in, in Christ and you're, you're becoming like a newborn child. You're becoming new. But in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 that lays out the groundwork of Luke's pneumatology, his focus on the Spirit in the book of Acts, uh, very similar to what he does in the Gospel of Luke. Acts 1.8, you will receive power. Think of Keswick, you know. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll be witnesses. It has to do with speaking for God. And Peter interprets it that way in Acts chapter 2, verses 17 and 18, where he says, this fulfills what the prophet Joel said, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh, your sons and daughters will prophesy. And he talks about dreams and visions. And then again in chapter 4, when the spirit is poured out, it says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. And there's this association with speaking for God throughout the book of Acts. The focus that Luke is going to zero in on doesn't mean he's excluding something else, but Luke is going to focus on empowerment to, to, to speak for God, prophetic empowerment, just like in uh, Luke's gospel and the infancy narratives, you have people being filled with the Spirit and prophesying, <laughs> speaking for God, or the prophecy that John the Baptist filled with the spirit from his mother's womb is, is going to be a prophet. Now, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 4, and a couple other times in Acts, but not, it's not stated always, but in these other occasions, it's said that they, uh, as they're filled with the spirit, they begin to speak in other tongues. Now, what does that have to do with prophecy and with speaking the word of the Lord in terms of witness? Well, what greater illustration could Luke give of being able to speak for God and be witnesses not just in Jerusalem or Judea or Samaria, but to the uttermost parts of the earth, than to empower people to speak in other people's languages, to worship God in other people's languages. And I think here we see the focus of what baptism in the Spirit means for Luke. Now, Often in Acts, it, it happens coincident with conversion. Or, well, it happens uh, at least in Acts 10, coincident with conversion, I believe. It happens 
in some passages really close to conversion. I mean, the, um, in Acts chapter 19, the, um, the roughly 12 disciples that, that Paul is with, he, he explains the gospel to them. He, uh, although there's debates about whether they were already disciples of Jesus or just disciples of John, but he explains something to them, lays hands on them, prays for them, and they're filled with the Spirit, and they speak in tongues and prophesy. But the, the, um, the language of baptism of the Spirit is used here and in Acts 10 and 11 for uh, people when they're converted. But the language of poured out, uh, the Spirit coming on people, people being filled with the Spirit, it's used all over the place in Acts. And it's not just used for one occasion. Sometimes, you know, with, you know, Peter's there in Acts 2, he's there in Acts 4, you know, he's like being filled with the Spirit more than, more than once. And you have occasions where it says that people were full of the Spirit, like continually maybe they're walking in the fullness of the Spirit. The, the point is that in Acts, the focus is on empowerment for mission. And sometimes we experience this empowerment subsequent to conversion. In Acts 8, they received the word of God with joy, they were baptized because they believed in Jesus' name. And then Peter and John come and lay hands on them that they might receive the Spirit. It doesn't mean that the Spirit wasn't already in them in terms of Pauline theology or Johannine theology. But in terms of what Luke wants to emphasize, they hadn't yet received the power of the Spirit for evangelism, for witness, for speaking prophetically for God. Uh, I believe Calvin spoke of it as receiving the, the gifts of the Spirit. So, uh, you know, whatever theological tradition you're from, uh, and, and also uh, sacramental traditions often use this to say, okay, well, you've got the Spirit uh, in one way before, but now you have the Spirit in an additional way at this point. I think what it's, it's inviting us to do is to recognize, yes, we, we have the Spirit once we follow Jesus, but we can open ourselves up more to the Spirit. We can welcome more of the Spirit's work in our lives. It invites us to follow that model. And in, as in the case of, of the Samaritans, sometimes we may have already the work of the Spirit in some ways in our lives, but there's other things we haven't yet experienced, and we should welcome those. So, do I believe that baptism in the Spirit happens at conversion or after conversion? My answer is yes. Baptism in the Spirit refers to the entire sphere of the Spirit's work, the eschatological end-time outpouring of God's Spirit. And we can experience that in more than one way, in more than one time. And by all means, if we, if we feel like we need more power from God in our witness, we should welcome that because we are called to be witnesses for Jesus, uh, following the model of Jesus' first witnesses because we still need the Spirit like they did to be witnesses to the ends of the earth.